National Trust has more than four million members. It's Britain's largest landowner, as English as cream teas. Or is it? Because it all began in Wales, where it continues to look after the treasures of this beautiful country. But I want to find out what the future holds for this guardian of our shared past. Well, there we are. That's what I call a classic National Trust property. One of the great stately homes of, uh, <laughs> I nearly said England, of Wales. It was built by successive lords and barons and marquises until in the 1970s, it simply became too expensive for them to look after. But if they couldn't manage it, how can National Trust Wales expect to? To find out, I'm going to investigate Plas Naueth on the island of Anglesey, North West Wales, once the family home of the Marquis of Anglesey. We're actually quite a long way from the fantasy of Downton Abbey. I'll be looking at some intriguing fine art. It's not just a house for connoisseurs, it's also a house for nosy parkers. I want to find out how this place is run. I would like to be the cleaner in here. And investigate how they intend to tackle this mansion's challenges. The first thing that confronts me is a monument from the deep past. 5,000 years ago, a Neolithic chieftain decided that this extraordinary place with its spectacular views was the ideal place to be buried and put this Cromley here. And in fact, it was only 600 years ago that somebody decided it should be called the Place Naueth. So new in New Palace, which is what that means, is a relative term here. The original building was put up in medieval times. It's been rebuilt and remodelled over the centuries, including major works by the great 18th century architect James Wyatt. To get a handle on all this, I'm meeting property manager Neris Jones. And this is the main Gothic Hall. This is the first place people would come to be impressed when they'd come in as visitors. Well, I'm impressed. It's got Tudor foundations. What you see really then is an 18th century building, but it's had turrets and towers added here and there. Basically, what we're looking at is a house that was lived in by a family with different marquises and different lords coming along at various stages and adding bits to it. They'd add their own stamp according to their taste. Right. And what's this through here? So, and there's a lot of taste to cover in 600 years, which is the challenge here. I'm about to be introduced, however, to the man who really put the house and the family and North West Wales at the centre of world affairs. And here we see the first Marquis. Henry William Paget became the first Lord Anglesey in 1815 as a reward for his bravery at the Battle of Waterloo. He was hit by grape shot and he turned to the Duke of Wellington. He said, by God, sir, I've lost my leg. Duke Wellington turned and looked and said, by God, sir, so you have, and went on surveying the battle. Thanks to Lord Anglesey, however, the Pagets became such a powerful family that the Place Naueth was merely a country retreat for successive marquises. That was until the end of the Victorian era, when Henry Cyril Paget inherited the estate. Oh, well, that's the fifth Marquis here, looking utterly magnificent. He was the sort of black sheep of the family because uh, he was a very glittery individual and he inherited the estate and the title and an income of £250,000 a year, which is equivalent of about £25 million a year, which he spent. The first to really call Plas Naueth his home, the fifth Marquis set about indulging his interest in jewellery, pink poodles and perfumed cars. 
He built a 150-seat theatre here. He'd give free shows for all the local people. Um, he spent an absolute fortune on cars, clothes and entertaining. And after spending half a billion, Henry was declared bankrupt in 1904. This was a significant moment for his house and his family and eventually for the trust because his creditors organised a 40-day sale in which the treasures were sold off. The house became less of a showpiece and more of a family home. By 1976, the seventh Marquis, Henry Paget, could no longer afford to maintain Plasnaweth. He handed it over to the care of the trust. He continued to play an active part in how it was run until his death in 2013. Now that responsibility falls on Neris. This is a lovely place in a lovely setting, but it could also be argued that that is part of its problem. Oh, what a fantastic view to wake up to. There's Snowden, quite visible because the Seventh Marquis insisted that the National Trust brought that land over there. So the vista was perfect. But in a way, of course, that is a little bit of the problem because that beautiful view there is of a, a wild and remote part of Wales. We're in a, a far northwest corner. There are towns here, there's Bangor and there's Carnarvon, but we are actually quite a long way, a good day trip from those huge centres of population like Manchester. So, how do we get the visitors to come here on a regular basis? At the moment, we get about 93,000 visitors every year. Um, we're a small property here compared to other National Trust properties. Um, and we don't get as many visitors because of where we're situated. You've got to think of new ideas to encourage visitors to come back. Definitely. If we don't have visitors, it means that we don't build up funds to keep this place forever. So we do have to also work a bit like a visitor attraction in that we need new things for people to see, whether that's opening a new room to the public, maybe letting them into the cellars, or putting on a series of events, whether they're outside or inside, to attract people to come back again and again. That's a lot of ambition. And something immediately becomes apparent. I think it may be connected with that bankruptcy sale 100 years ago. Catherine Manners, distant relative, painted by Van Dyke. But there aren't really, in this house, so many very important pieces that people come here to tick them off, like they might at the National Gallery. The Trust has to sell this house to visitors on a different principle. And for that purpose, the most interesting painting here is not an old master at all. Said to be the largest mural in Europe, this painting was commissioned to decorate the dining room in 1936. The artist, Rex Whistler, has a museum dedicated to his work in the old kitchen. But it is his relationship with the family that the Trust really wants to unlock and use. And the picture is the key. Whistler paints himself here with a brush. The young boy stealing an apple is his pal, the future seventh Marquis, as a child. But it was the girl in the boat, Lady Caroline, the little boy's sister, who became an obsession for the artist Whistler. He was said to be the model for Charles Ryder in Brideshead Revisited someone who was in love with the idea of a great stately home and also, so they say, in love with the daughter of the house. The relationship was undoubtedly intense while it lasted, as his portraits of her reveal. But this is the question. Can the National Trust use stories like this 
to make up for what was lost in the bankruptcy sale. The great story here, and as you go down here, is a love story. Justin Albert, trust director in Wales, certainly seems to have that ambition. That thing that National Trust called Spirit of Place, but just storytelling, is phenomenal. The story behind this family, that it was a, it was a pleasure house that turned into a family house, is in itself a reason to come here. You can come and wander around here and you can be the Anglesey's for a day, and that's kind of fun. Can the Trust preserve the atmosphere and look of a family home from the 1930s? So let's go into Lady Anglesey's lounge. And you can see the feminine influence of Sybil Colfax here. Mm. Sybil Colfax was the society decorator who reinvented the idea of the country house. She aimed at comfort, not display. The Trust is not intending to create an historical museum behind red ropes, but allow the public to enjoy that comfort and poke about in a house that remained largely unchanged over the last 80 years. With the passing of the last Marquise of Anglesey, she now has a blank sheet of paper. She can now do what she wants to do. She will talk to the family, she will reflect their wishes, and the, I believe very strongly as she does, the family should be part of the decision making, because without a family, the place is dead. This is an why interesting should why, decision... should, why is the family still involved in something which effectively has now become um, uh, the, uh, into the ownership of a much bigger group, which is the National Trust? Whatever you think about the aristocracy, whatever you think, they have a validity in the houses that they lived in and built and procreated in and did all the fun things over the millennia and centuries. Um, without a family being involved with it, the place is dead. There's no spirit. And a way to experience this spirit for the trust is free flow, where you can walk around, unguided, at your own pace. It's not just a house for connoisseurs. It's also a house for nosy parkers. My aim is that every room looks as if Lord Anglesey has just left the room. So it does look like a home that is lived in. This idea extends throughout the house. And the latest challenge is this room. The seventh Marquis, the last to live here, died in 2013. This is his study. It is exactly as he left it. This is the room that he used to work in. It is. This is his hub of the home. He's got a desk for every task. This is his writing desk where he would have written his yeah. books. Yeah. Um, a correspondence desk where he would have written to friends and family. Right. Um, a research corner where he'd do his academic work and where he wrote his eight volume history of the British cavalry. After the 7th Marquis gave the house to National Trust Wales in 1976, he remained active in the building conservation movement and local affairs. Well, when, when people come here, yeah. they want to see a proper house. They don't want to see a mess like this, do they? I think they do want to see a mess, but it is an organised mess, I would say. This is how the 7th Marquis operated. And I think if we tidied this up, we'd just be tidying away his personality and his character. You can still smell his cigars. Um, and when we do open it, I will make sure that his opera will be playing as well. So it's using all the senses to evoke that feeling when people come so in. Are you, going to, are you going to light a cigar? I don't know if we'll go that far. At the moment, it still smells of the cigars. I've noticed that there are parts of the carpet which are quite worn away. Are you going to get rid of there those? Are. No, definitely not. We'd be ruining the spirit of place if we did that. Lord Anglesey, wherever he sat, um, 
was known for shuffling his feet, so he would wear away the carpet quite easily. And at every desk in this room, he's actually eventually decided to cut out the carpet um, and stick it down um, so that he doesn't get his feet caught in the holes that he's been wearing. Neris plans to have the study open for visitors in the summer of 2015. I'm just glad I'm not one of the cleaners. In some of the rooms, the Trust are not only conserving signs of the family, they're actively creating them. It's a goose's egg cut that way, and a, hen, a hen's egg cut that way. That's, that's, that's that very good, isn't it? Here's an imaginary breakfast, with clear evidence of where Lord Anglesey would sit. And they've taken one of his jackets out of storage to complete the scene. What do we call this? Creative curation? In the living room, it's tea time. Yeah, it's all laid out just as it might have been, including a rather stale looking scones and a news chronicle waiting to be read, as if Lord and Lady Anglesey have just popped out to the shrubbery to have a row about that oik whistler trying to chat up their daughter, Lady Paget. But how far do you go? Do you have a couple of damp Labradors smelling in the hall? Do you, do you put dirty footprints across the carpet? Do you ever, as the National Trust, say, no, no, stop, actually, where it is, is, is enough, we've got there? We have to evolve, we have to adapt. We make mistakes, we will make mistakes. We'll do some really crappy interpretations sometimes. We'll do some good interpretations, but unless, we're, unless we adapt continuously, we won't survive. One way that Neris is aiming to survive is to develop the story of the house by bringing back a member of the family currently conspicuous in his absence. The more respectable members of the family, like the first Marquis, have their own museums to tell their stories. But hardly visible at all is the most colourful character. The fifth Marquis, the dancing Marquis. In a way, the family didn't really want him to be on display. They tended to not refer to him. So Neris has brought him back into prominence, perhaps against the family's wishes. Neris is hoping to convince Justin to invest in a part of the estate that she thinks could illuminate the Victorian party atmosphere of the Fifth Marquis. A series of tunnels from the house run directly to the Menai Straits definitely needs to be part of the visit because it's such a historic part of the house. Neris is hoping Justin will find money to reopen the tunnels and create a new attraction. This is how supplies got to the house, but it was also a place of recreation. When the tide is low, the water is held in a pool and it would have been lit by torches. There are tales of Victorian swimming parties here. So this is where the tunnel is, right? So if you go through here, you'll find a 200 metre tunnel leading directly to the house. Yes. Well, this is where the entrance would have been, so um, we're going to have to knock through here. The tunnels were closed by the sixth Marquis, possibly for safety reasons, but also perhaps to distance the family from their predecessor's decadent reputation. The family itself, for a long time, didn't really want to recognise the existence of the Marquis. As much as perhaps the family at one point disliked how he had made them appear to the outside world, he's still part of the history of this place and he actually meant a lot to the local community here. And I think that's a really important thing to bring across to our visitors. Whether Neris is right or wrong in welcoming the black sheep back into the family, it will cost money. And this is a place that eats money. There's no stop to conservation, because things just get worse and worse and worse and worse. If you look at Place now, of the 20 rooms we show, there's usually another 60 rooms that we can't show because they're falling apart. Uh, and that is a continually growing conservation crisis that National Trust faces. The costs of running a place like this do keep mounting. They need visitors, but visitors 
bring wear and tear. The National Trust inherits the actual problems that the family would have had, including just standard maintenance. Stair rods don't clean themselves, although they do get the help of volunteers. But 90,000 visitors quickly take their toll, and this carpet gets worn away. So much so that it had to be replaced at the end of the 90s with a nice new one from Bulgaria. Some of the expenses are less visible. Well, now, here's an important treasure that not a lot of people notice. The central heating. In today's money, it would cost about £80,000 in oil to heat this house. So you have inherited that problem? I have. And what are you doing about that? <laughs> we are getting rid of oil and we are installing a marine source heat pump which is going to take heat directly from the Menai Straits, convert it into electricity um, and heat the whole of the mansion. This is a major undertaking for Neris and the Trust. The heat pump will be one of the biggest in Europe. Cutting-edge green technology, it is expected to save the estate over £40,000 a year. But it's not actually a new idea. In fact, the last Marquis had considered exactly the same solution. He was a few years ahead of the National Trust. I've actually found an article that the Seventh Marquis has ripped out of country life, stuck a note on it saying, wouldn't this be a good idea, but I'm sure we can't afford it. Um, and then the National Trust energy people came along and decided, let's use some energy that we already have all around us, convert that into the heat that's going to be used to heat the entire house. Unlike the poor old Marquis, the organisation does have the funds for big investments like this. They're prepared to pay the £600,000 because they've taken on this place forever. They estimate that the pump will pay for itself over time. But the spending doesn't stop at the front door. This is not just a great house. It's inarguably a great setting place. Now, if has 160 acres or more of grounds looked after by four and a half gardeners. That's 30 acres each. And everybody has to be aware of the tight budget. We're very good at making do and scavenging and finding things in skips and converting them from you know, refuge into the highest quality visitor attractions. The garden we see here dates from the 1780s. Part of it was created by the great landscape designer, Humphrey Repton. His most visible legacy is the grand mile-long drive. While Repton's design would have aimed to absorb the family for a whole summer, how can a day visitor appreciate something of this scale? People can easily miss a lot of the very interesting things that there are. So Paul is building little features around the gardens to help orientate people in this huge space. Dad, come here. And one of the things I'm quite opposed to is signs. I don't like signs at all. They're intrusive. And my philosophy has always been you get people to move around a place not by saying the such and such is over there with an arrow pointing. You have something on the near horizon which is interesting and draws their attention. But the grounds will always throw up unexpected problems. I don't know if you can see, but we've got a couple of sheep in the garden. Can you stay there? That's, that's good. It's very annoying. And they eat plants, which costs us a bit of money some of the old plants and trees from years and years ago will die. Now, do we replant them exactly the same or do we add a little bit of our own interpretation? That's a question we face every day. Do you think you could get Paul? There's a tree come down. It's not going to roll over anywhere, anyway. No, it isn't. This is one of our two Zelkova Ceratis. Right, Jill told me this morning it was a Zelkova, but I, I didn't Did get the full name. Oh, yeah, she tried to call it a Jalfrezi at first and realised that was a, an Indian curry. curry. The Trust cannot simply look after a place. Their mission 
evolves continuously. There is still hidden potential to be uncovered. Neris takes me down to the cellars, where the family stored their bits and bobs. But what bits and what bobs? And the whole of this cellar is full of stuff like this. It's just full of family treasures. They've all been stored away for years and years, and now we're unwrapping them. Wrapped away as if it was of no consequence is a spyglass that belonged to Napoleon. Some of the first Marquis's crutches. You can see the A for Anglesey on it. And here's another useful find, something given to the fifth Marquis by the locals of Menai Bridge back in 1896. Our most hearty congratulations upon your attaining the 21st anniversary of your birth, crawlers. Down here, we have, what, a hundred Christmases. You know, darling, what have you brought me? I brought you this trowel. Darling, what did you think of the pen I bought you? I loved it, darling. I loved it. And what do you do with it? You put it with the others. I know how she feels, you know. <laughs> you have had Christmases like that as well. If Neris has her way, these unconsidered trifles of a family's life are destined to make their way into the daylight. Meanwhile, the diary of visitor attractions continues. Neris has organised VIP fee-paying events, like this tea in the Whistler Room. We wouldn't normally let anybody sit there, let alone eat there, so it's definitely a special occasion. Previously unseen bedrooms and bathrooms are being opened to view. It's nice because for years, obviously, it's been closed off to the public and the only people that would have been able to see this room would have been the Anglesey's guests. And the heat is on. It's really nicely warm now. The history of this house from the time of the first Baron Paget has been one of extraordinary complexity and invention and change. And now the trust own it. They've owned it for a, a, a tiny amount of time by comparison. Perhaps they'll own it for a further 600 years. But does their ownership mean that the story has finished? Or are there future changes to come? I put that to Justin. However much we play around a little bit by opening up another room or opening up a tunnel or looking after the, the grounds or perhaps growing another tree or even putting an exhibition in the, in the stables over there yep. and changing things, essentially what's happened is we've reached a moment in time where we say, finish, full stop, that's, that's it. I hope not. I hope not, I really hope not. I hope this house grows and builds its collection. There's elements here, they'll always stay the same. But there's elements we can change. And I think the National Trust will become more of a curatorial organisation. If we don't move the times, we will stagnate, and Naris will have less and less and less visitors every year. Of course, in the old days, if you were a baron or a lord or even a dancing marquis, then you could pretty much do what you liked with this place. You could add an extra wing or an octagonal tower or knock a bit down or even go off to the south of France and forget about it altogether. But if your National Trust Wales, you don't have that option. And there'll always be quite a few people keeping an eye on you. Mm -hmm.